everyone, welcome to the Mega C Sweet Stories. My name is Shamin Tan and I'm your host today. And I'm really, really excited because today we have a special guest with us, Preston Miller. He is the Chief Information Security Officer at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And he previously was at Pentagon, DC, Washington, you know, where he was with the Department of Defense. So Preston, I'm delighted to have you here with us today. Are you able to give us an introduction to your background and experience? Absolutely. And I, I just want to repeat again, Shaman, just uh, I really appreciate the invite to, to talk about uh, some, of, some of the ongoing and happenings in the InfoSec community. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of the conversation. Um, so yeah, just a quick, quick uh, um, sort of background of my career and, and how, you know, how I've gotten to the point of CISO for NASA JPL. Um, so I really started off my, uh, my InfoSec career in the military. I, I was in the U.S. Army for about 10 years. Uh, where I worked as an information system specialist. Um, from there, I was doing just your address help desk, um, we were routing and switching. Um, but about year five or six into the military, uh, I configured my first Cisco 525 PIX firewall. Um, and, I, uh, wow. and I started to, to recognize uh, so that the, the industry and some things that were happening uh, uh, in the country and some things were happening across the industry, trending towards security at the time of was InfoSec, information security. Um, I think it, it sort of evolved into cybersecurity. So very early on in my career in the military, I noticed that uh, cybersecurity and InfoSec um, was starting to sort of, you know, um, make sort of waves and document changes in the way we were doing business. You know, everything tied back to a security risk, everything was going to tie back to um, some sort of InfoSec uh, capacity. So I really started to pick up the ball from there. Um, so once I got out of the military, I was fortunate enough to transition into a, a role in an InfoSec with the Department of Defense at the Pentagon, where I worked there for about six years, uh, primarily as a cyber risk analyst um, and an incident response analyst. Um, from there, I was able to make the transition to NASA Ames Research Center, where I worked as the cybersecurity operations manager for about three years. Um, a short stint there, then I transitioned to NASA JPL, uh, where I worked as the section manager for networking, uh, cybersecurity, and identity. Um, and a year later, I found myself uh, fortunate enough to be the CISO, the chief information security officer for NASA JPL. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Preston, for going through all of your background and your experience. I love that it's so rich and diverse at the same time. So given the fact that you came from a very different industry and being in NASA is an entirely different world, can you share more about your journey? What has that looked like for you? And when you first started, what were the key things that you had to adapt or do security differently? Absolutely, Shermaine. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so... Um, my parameters around cybersecurity, information security was pretty straightforward uh, in the military and the Department of Defense, right? We were supporting a warfighter and the sort of the tip of the spear for InfoSec was confidentiality, right? So um, can we relay messages to our to our um, to our downrange warfighter? And uh, can we ensure that confidentiality around around those messages or around those operations, right? So um, ensuring that we, you know, we had levels of encryption, we had operational security. Um, and so everything that we were doing was really geared towards confidentiality. Um, I made the transition to NASA and I ran into a bit of a culture shock. Um, be, it's simply because um, the main business of NASA is to share information, science data with our external partners um, and to build spacecrafts and to uh, the land on you know, planets like Mars. And so overall, just advance humanity's understanding of the, of the universe and the solar system. Um, very different objective to supporting the warfighters and they have very different care about from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, for, for the old school cybersecurity uh, professionals will be familiar with the CIA tri uh, triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, and my role in the DOD and the military, confidentiality was at the top of that list. In my role at NASA, integrity is at the top of that list. It's not so much that we're trying to keep the data that we're sharing safe, it's can we trust the data that we're sharing back and forth between our communities, and can we trust the data that we're sending back and forth to our spacecraft and operations. Um, so I had to adopt an entirely different uh, mentality when thinking about um, how are we defining risk, right? What are our, what are our primary concerns uh, from a cyber risk perspective? And how are, am I communicating with our business leaders around cyber risk? 
Um, again, it's just aligning with those business objectives, ensuring that cybersecurity is seen as an enabler to those business objectives. That's very different from a um, uh, from operations that is happening in the DoD and operations that are happening in NASA to uh, to support a spacecraft. In that context, right? How did you align cyber risk according to the business understanding of risk? Oh yes, uh, very good question. So I think the, the for sure business, and, and this is a continual process, right? These, these are things that you continually work on is um, understanding the sort of the risk thresholds and the risk appetites of the business units, right? So, um, and that really involves sitting down with our system engineers, sitting down with our business leaders, sitting, sitting down with the project managers of these uh, space operations to understand what they care about, right? What, what do they identify as risk to their mission? If I come to you and say, hey, you know, there, there's a, we're, we're seeing the platform you're operating on has a, has a number of vulnerabilities. Um, how do I translate that into mission risk for them, right? Um, and once I better understand how they think about mission risk, I'm better informed on how they address those, those cybersecurity risks on their behalf and to inform them, inform them of the risk decisions that they, um, risk decisions to, so they can make informed decisions. Um, so it's really that process of understanding the business, understanding the core business, understanding what our care about are as a, a, across these multiple business units, sitting down with those business owners, those system owners to understand what their care about are, and then find, figuring out a way to communicate um, risks in the same language. Oftentimes, so one of the things I found out early on that, that sort of tripped me up is I was coming in speaking a language about cyber risks that, that no one on the other side recognized or appreciated. Um, so I had to break down some of those language barriers, right? So I had, I had to, uh, you know, understand what they meant by a significant risk was very different than what I meant by a significant risk. Um, and once we started to have those conversations, once they trusted the cybersecurity team um, as an enabler, those those conversations which were much easier to have. No, that's definitely important as well because it's um it's about learning how to articulate that in a language that they understand and if you were to break it down so it's really good that you took time to understand what's important to them how do they define risk because that's different um in different industry if you can break it down a bit like how did that look like you know what kind of conversation did you have to tweak when yeah. you're talking to the business yeah, yeah. Um, I, I give you a, a primary example, right? Just, uh, just uh, off the cuff here. Uh, um, so there was a, um, so there was a platform being used in, in one of our, uh, one of our legacy space operations, um, and that platform happened to be using um, some legacy um, operating systems that were no longer supported, right? So here I come, you know, Mr. CISO, where there were, where there were vulnerability report in hand, saying, "Hey, project manager, there's these, you know, there's these a dozen risk." Um, a dozen vulnerabilities uh, against your old platform that you're running over there. Um, here's your risk picture. You're you're at a high critical, you know, you're at a critical risk threshold. Um, the response I got was, uh, Preston, I'm still able to land spacecraft on Mars, whether I have those old operating systems or not. Um, I do not understand or appreciate uh, you telling me that I have a, I'm at a critical risk threshold. Uh, when when my operations is still intact and I'm able to perform my, my mission functions um, using an old platform. Um, that was a wake up call for me because it was absolutely right, right? Everything that was related to me uh, made complete sense after that conversation, right? So uh, if I see myself as a business enabler from a cybersecurity perspective, I need to be able to, I need to be able to bring you actionable information um, and uh, real information around what risks um, is out there for you, not just a vulnerability management report, not just an Excel spreadsheet with, uh, with the, you know, latest Adobe patches for you, for you and your engineers to solve. What sort of intelligence am I giving you, right? What sort of actionable information am I giving you? How am I characterizing and converting that into risk for you? Um, so I changed the conversation around it. Like, hey, so that old platform that you're using has a direct tie to this mission critical system. Right. And if we take those vulnerabilities that we find in an old platform, here's how an attacker can exploit those things to get access to that mission critical system. That can mean mission failure for you. Right? Once I started to talk in those terms with our business leaders, we got a much better response um, on some of our cybersecurity principles.
I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, thanks for demonstrating how it actually look like executing that conversation, the business, and and how do you really interpret it? And I've actually heard you share about this before, where there's so much resistance sometimes to the role of the sizeo because they have this stigma attached to them that it's all about being an obstacle actually and a roadblocker. And something you shared before about it's not about saying no to them. But it's about giving them that knowledge, right, and actually doing it the right way. And you've just demonstrated how you've done it that changed and shifted their mindset and to how they perceive cyber risk. Yeah, yeah. Just to piggyback on that, right? So, uh, so I've, I've been on this campaign to change our cybersecurity offers from the office of no to the office of no, right? K N O W. Right. Are we informing our end users of the right security principles, processes, and procedures? Right. Are are we the office that they can rely on as a strategic partner at designing uh, secure operations and secure systems? Right. We don't want to be uh, the office that comes and tells you no. You, you know, we're going to uh, essentially or potentially be an obstacle uh, to your mission success. No, we want to give you the tools. We want to get the information to design secure spacecraft, design secure systems, um, because we want to be enabled to your mission success, right? So um, that, again, that comes with building that trust, that comes to having the conversations, um, that that comes with having an open mind and not just uh, regurgitating what what we find in our regulations, what we find in our requirements. It's it's actually just sort of turning that knob to to look at cyber as as sort of a uh, end user support model, right? So as a, um, so again, as a uh, contributor to a mission success, as opposed to um, just the office of NOAA, just the office of regulations. Um, and that, that subtle little nod there, right? That subtle change, um, again, just really created a space where folks feel comfortable coming to cyber, right? Hey, I, I have this issue, right? We're, we're, we're taking on a, you know, we're, we're trying to move some of our operations to the cloud, but we want to do things the right way, right? Coming to our team is the right answer. Um, trying to circumvent security controls is the wrong answer. So how do we position ourselves for folks to come to us when they have, uh, when they have these questions about how to design a uh, secure uh, platform? So that's the point we want to get to. I really love that. Like the office of no, I think that that is a brilliant way of changing the way people perceive no to KNOW. So thank you so much for sharing that. We definitely need to be changing this perspective and and talking about it a lot more and raising the awareness in this space. So I really appreciate all that you do, Preston. We're going to the next part now where I really just want to understand a bit for every size, there are different things that keep them up awake at night. Uh, So for you, what would be the number one challenge or the number one fear that you have? Yeah. How much time do you have? Because it's a pretty considerable list, but if I can narrow it down, I, I would say, uh, uh, so there's, there's two things that I have in mind here that I, that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, right? So um, sort of an a industry trend that, I, that I've seen or, or sort of across the industry, um, some of the things that, that uh, you know, keep me up at night or some things that, that I'm constantly thinking about. Um, how prepared are we as a country, right? How prepared are, are we as an industry um, uh, for this new wave of sophisticated attacks, uh, particularly against our critical infrastructure? Um, I, I think we've all been uh, sort of uh, almost, you know, uh, you know, for better or worse, become accustomed to uh, these weekly or daily uh, briefs and, and news clips that we see about it, the next, you know, the latest ransom attack, the latest data breach. Um, but, uh, you know, as of late, there's been a trend against uh, 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 particularly critical infrastructure. You look at the, look at the, um, the gas pipeline on the East Coast in the United States. Um, you look at a couple other, uh, the, the, meat, uh, the meat producer as well. Um, so what we're seeing is, is, is a level of sophistication and targeted attacks against, um, against critical structure, uh, critical infrastructure, against service pipelines. How prepared are we as an industry to take that on, right? What sorts of things are we doing to, to, uh, uh, to really ready ourselves and batten down the ha- hatches uh, for things like operational technology, internet of things? Um, I, you know, that is a, in my, at least in my opinion, that is still sort of a, a maturing um, uh, area for us in InfoSec, right? Um, designing adequate security around uh, Internet of Things, ICS, SCADA systems, ensuring that we have repeatable processes when you go from um, uh, one SCADA infrastructure to the next, um, having the sort of the regulations and the support from our governing bodies um, to enforce and secure those things. 
Um, so that keeps me up at night, right? So um, I think about our, particularly in, in sort of in my craft, I think about our, our satellites, right? I think about our, our low earth orbiters. Um, I think about our, J, our, our GPS infrastructure. Um, that to me is critical infrastructure, right? The, the in ability or inability to secure um, so that, that satellite infrastructure, that GPS infrastructure, I think poses a grave threat to national security um, and the InfoSec community writ large. Um, so if you had to ask me what keeps me up at night, right? So, uh, you know, some, some days I have nightmares about uh, a widespread attack against our energy grid or widespread attack against our GPS infrastructure. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that definitely keeps me up at night. Yeah, that's uh, a lot of uh, things to keep you up at night and I don't know how you manage it with sleep. <laughs> But thanks for going through the details because I was going to ask you how did that apply in NASA JPL's context as well. And for so long, OT and IT has been in silos and it's been separated. And, and it's really good that now we are seeing more conversations and awareness and people are recognizing the need for it to be seen together as well and being taken the whole thing into context. It's all part of the whole ecosystem in that sense. Speaking of, you talk about ransomware, you know, JBS with what's happening in the industry. So for you, how would that look like in terms of designing your disaster recovery response when you look at what's happening around the world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, again, that's a continual process for us, right? So continue to redefining um, sort of uh, our approaches to um, the changes in TTPs or, or tactics, you know, techniques and protocols of, uh, of the threat actors that are, that are posed the most risk to us. Um, so it's a continual learning process, right? We're uh, making sure we tapped into the right, uh, threat intelligence channels, um, to, to see what tactics are being used. Um, looking across at, at, you know, other sectors and, and sort of light organizations to, um, if we can find any lessons learned there, if we can partner with them, but essentially it comes down to some of the basics for us, right? So, um, our are we executing on and practicing sort of our incident response plans, right? Are we executing on and, and uh, continually executing against our business continuity plans, right? Have we defined our high value assets in a way, right? Or do we have the adequate protections and failovers uh, around our, 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 um, our HVAs or high value assets? And for us, uh, from a business continuity perspective, we're really to look at it from, from two perspectives. This is what we do for the institution, right? So this, this is what we do for the, the enterprise writ large, right? Um, you know, whether that be some of our uh, core business functions, our core business applications, right? Do we, are we backing those up regularly? Do we have our, our, our hot sites? Do we have our warm sites? How often are we testing that, right? Are we doing that on an annual basis uh, for, for the entire suite? Are we doing it on a quarterly basis for the more, uh, more business critical? And there's also the support we give um, and the support we provide from business continuity and a mission continuity standpoint for our missions, right? So, um, you know, and they happen on a uh, much more frequent cycle, particularly around sort of our, some of our mission critical endeavors. Um, so whenever we put a spacecraft uh, um, up in space and we track it towards Mars, there's going to be different periods along the operations where we want to make sure that we, we, we do have a review, we do have a business continuity plan, and it's tested over and over again. So we really got to have to keep our eyes on two balls here. Um, and it, well, what are we doing for the enterprise writ large, right? How are we, how are we uh, ensuring continuity of our core business applications? And also in a very specific sense, what are we doing for that, for that mission, right? And we're, we're spending, we're, we're sending that uh, half a billion dollars up into space um, and we're using these ground systems to support it. What sort of business continuity principles are we putting in place here that look, may look different from what we do from an enterprise perspective? So uh, this is sort of a balancing act between the two, but we definitely keep our eyes on both of those folks. Yeah, that's quite a lot of things to take into consideration when you're planning all these BCPs. How often would you recommend in terms of the frequency to run them? Absolutely. Right. So uh, I think first order of business is, is uh, you know, making sure you have a good understanding of your of your IT infrastructure, right? Make sure we have you have a good understanding of your of your data centers, how they're laid out, where your critical applications live, um, you know, uh, what sort of infrastructure surrounds it. Um, I, I think the general sense is a, a, at least a yearly exercise, a true to form uh, business continuity exercise, disaster recovery exercise, where you're hopefully you're in a position where you can do some um, um, some true fail of service and cut over to um, to some of your um, uh, some of your business continuity plans. Um, and it is so I would say at a minimum you want to do that on a yearly basis. However, as I mentioned earlier, if there are mission critical applications that that you know 
know that, you know, um, or through your analysis, if any of these applicants go down for a significant amount of time, your business is, will be significantly impacted. Maybe you want to do that in a more reoccurring cycle, right? Maybe you want to face that in, in, on a quality basis um, to ensure that those, mis those missing critical, uh, the business critical applications and the services are well tested, right? Or, and, and resolute and have a sense of um, and resiliency around them. Um, so I, again, I, I, I would say annually at a minimum, and for your business critical applications, think about some, doing something on a quality basis, even if that's just a tabletop exercise. You know, ha having that muscle memory there for your system admins, having that muscle memory there for your, uh, for your business admins uh, to know what to do in the case of an event, uh, I think it's really good and, and you, should, you should be able to test it as often as possible. Love that. You've shared a lot of great practical tips and I feel like you've crammed a lot in a short period of time. So thank you so much for that. Preston, any last words or parting advice you would give? What's your top tip you would leave for aspiring sizos or sizos who are new to the industry or, or moving to a new industry, actually? What would your mm -hmm. top advice be for them? Yeah, uh, I think my, my, my first tip uh, to anyone aspiring to be a, a CISO is you know, be ready to do the work, right? Uh, and enjoy the journey uh, and, and sort of trust the process, right? So uh, I, I think um, I think CISOs are often one of those roles that is, you know, looked at from two different perspectives, right? Like so there, I think there's one count that says, you know, it's a really tough job, really unappreciated, right? Like who, who would ever want that, right? So again, you mentioned sort of the, the stigma against cybersecurity being in the office of no, and, and you know, this is has an impossible a job. Um, and this is this other camp that really, like, like, that really sort of glamorizes um, the the idea that the CISO and the, and the ability to impact change and the ability to sort of transform an organization by biz, being a business enabler. Um, the truth of the matter is, most of your time is spent somewhere in the middle, um, and it's and it's about the process. Um, I had I have to wake up every day and convince myself that it's about the process, and I should trust the process and enjoy the journey. It's not always about the destination. Um, and the second piece of advice I would give us, Brian and CISO, is, is be ready to listen, right? So uh, we may know our crap inside and out. That does us no good if we can't tie that back to make the business successful. Uh, so be ready to listen to your business partners, right? Come in there with a, an open mind and open heart um, to understand where they are so you can apply your expertise um, to move the organization ahead. Um, so, th of course, there's going to be some things we have to stand our ground on. Um, but, and oftentimes what I, what I find in, in my role and in any role, people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Show up with being willing to show that you care about their business, care about their success. Um, and I think that will be, you know, pay many dividends for you and your endeavors as a security professional. Love that. It's really about being genuine. And at the same time, being willing to take the journey with people, bringing them along the journey with you as well, and being patient about the whole process yeah. and focusing on the outcome. Yeah. So what a way to put it. Like, yeah, could I have said it better? <laughs> but so thank you so Absolutely. much, Preston. Yeah, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to have you here on the show. Really, thank you for taking your time out. I know it's like in the evening for you over there in the US. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you again. And to the next one. Take care.